None of the Gospels are signed. We don't have originals, but none of them claim to be written by the individual whose name is attached to them. None of them claim to be eyewitnesses. The closest we get is the Gospel of John's suggestion. This is the Gospel of John's suggestion that this Gospel is based on the writings of the, dis the beloved disciple, the disciple Jesus loves. But that person isn't identified or referenced with that term outside of the book of John. All right, what say you, Dr. Lycona? Well, it is true that the Gospels are anonymous. I mean, you know, what we see the titles that say the Gospel according to Matthew, Gospel according to Mark, etc. But it's it's there's a, a, a good likelihood that they were those titles were not in the autographs. But this really is a non-issue because, with only two exceptions, no ancient biographers whose writings have survived. Um, none of them identified themselves. The only two exceptions are Lucian, who wrote in the middle of the second century, he wrote something called The Passing of Peregrinus, um, and that's anonymous, or that lists the author, um, Lucian. And then you've got The Life of Elias in the Historia, uh, Historia Augusta, which was written in, the, I, I think, the late fourth, early fifth century, and it's fictitious. Those are the only two biographies in antiquity for which the author identifies them himself. Um, it's possible that Suetonius identifies himself in the life of uh, Julius Caesar. He, he wrote the, uh, the lives of the divine Caesars, uh, so 12 Caesars, and we have those, um, and he doesn't identify himself throughout them, even in the, in the preface or the proem of any of them. But the life of Julius Caesar was the first one, and he may have identified himself in that one, but it has been lost. The uh, beginning of it has been lost. So we'll never know. All we can say is in the other 11, he doesn't identify himself. And with only the two exceptions I mentioned, no other ancient biographer identifies himself. They're all anonymous. So this uh, is very I, this is very common, and part of the way you establish this, I would imagine, is this looking at classical literature and looking at the Gospels as you've done as like you did for your book on the Gospels, right? I mean, this is and that's something. Isn't that somewhat of a um, isn't isn't that a recent approach? I don't know how recent it is. I mean, certainly they, there were some who were doing it in antiquity. Um, and even in this time, um, I think Tacitus, uh, you know, mentions his name in the proem of uh, his Annals of Rome. I, but, I mean, some do. So, but almost all biographers didn't. Uh, no, I mean, what, what I'm saying is the, the, the looking at the classical literature and then looking at the Gospels as Greco-Roman biography and, and making a comparison. That, isn't that kind of a, a somewhat young uh, investigation? Or am I oh, wrong? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, you had some scholars in the 1970s like Charles Talbert and some others and then David Ani. And through their studies, they were proposing that the Gospels belong to the genre of Greco-Roman biography. Um, the most influential work was in 1992 by Richard Burridge. And um, in his work that was done um, over in the UK, his doctoral work, um, and it was published as What Are the Gospels? And it's, I mean, it was just a watershed book where he argued that they were Greco-Roman biographies. In fact, the 25th anniversary edition just came out last year. Now, there has been debate um, over um, other issues within it. Most New Testament scholars today think that it, I mean, you know, you'll have some detractors and some scholars who say, no, they're not Greco-Roman biographies. Uh, but most think that they are. Um, there's some, probably most of the dispute is over Luke uh, and they'd say, well, it's, uh, you know, that's history. That's just part one and, and acts is part two. It's all history. I, I think they're, you know, you got part one, part two, but I, I don't think there's really any question that Luke is a biography. Um, the genre was fluid. There was a lot of overlap at times and Luke does have overlap with history, but it's certainly a biography because it's focusing on the life of Jesus. Uh, in a similar way, Plutarch's Life of Julius Caesar is a biography and has the same overlap with the histor his historical genre as Luke has, but, but no one would consider that a history. 
rather than a biography. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, and I think, I think we would say that many scholars, if not most would either say it's Greco-Roman biography or something that has affinities with Greco-Roman biography. Exactly. We share a lot in common with Greco-Roman biography more than it would with anything else. And I know someone could say here, what about Jewish biography? Since, uh, you know, probably all of that, all of the gospel authors, except for Luke were Jews. Well, the problem is, is that, um, you've got Philo's Life of, of um, Moses, written in the earlier part of the first century, the first half of the first century. You've got Josephus' autobiography in, toward the end of the first century. Um, and you also have Philo's Life of um, Joseph and Life of Abraham, but those are very much different than his Life of Moses, um, very much. And his Life of Moses is more akin to Greco-Roman biography, um, very much like the Gospels. So, and it's something Louis Feldman has said, and he was, you know, what, uh, he died just a few years ago, but he was, you know, a Jewish scholar on this stuff, and he said, other than Philo's three biographies and Josephus's autobiography, we don't have any biographies of of Jewish sages up until modern times, he says. So for some reason, Jews have just not, they've just decided not to write biographies of their sages. So if the gospel authors were going to use, uh, write a biography of Jesus, Greco-Roman biography was pretty much the only game in town. Wow. So, so, you, so the first thing you want to say about this is it's not uncommon for something to be formally anonymous in that way. That's right. Um, do, are we in are we in hot water here then? If we believe or or take the position that um, that these were written by eyewitnesses or someone giving us the testimony of an eyewitness? No, um, you know because even though the Gospels don't formally claim to be written by eyewitnesses, um, we have good evidence that they they were. Um, I mean, at least they contain eyewitness testimony. They're rooted in eyewitness testimony. So, for example, our earliest source, external source, would be Papias. And it's disputed when he wrote, but typically the range is the year 100 to 150. And most scholars land on about 130. I think it's between 100 and 110. But let's just go with the scholarly consensus. You've got uh, 130. Papias attributes authorship to Matthew and Mark. Okay. Papias said he got his information from an associate of one of Jesus' apostles, and that he did so while while that apostle was still alive and teaching. So that means that Papias is claiming that he received this information in the latter part of the first century. So even if he's writing around the year 130, which again, I think is too late, but even if he's writing then, he still received this information from a, an associate of one of Jesus' apostles at the end of the first century. That's remarkable. It really is. Yeah, because then, I don't I don't mean to interrupt you, Mike, but uh, and, and we do need to get back to, as people are saying, have we played a clip from Matt yet? Uh, we'll get back to that in a minute. But I do want to say, um, you've been to Turkey. You've been to Hierapolis, I assume, up there above Palma Calais, where I think that's where Papias was living, right, in, in Hierapolis, and yep. was interviewed. He made it a point to interview people passing through this crossroad city that Hierapolis was and get their, get firsthand information if he could. And he said, you know, he says that he's living right down the road from a couple of lesser known disciples of Jesus. And so you have all of that right there. Um, I remember when I was there, I thought this is just, you're living history here. You know, you're right here where Papias, was. anyway, but I think that that's the context people might not realize. Well, Papias, who's this? Well, he's somebody who was in the living memory of all of these things. Um, some of the apostles, uh, disciples at least, were still alive at the time uh, that he was alive. And, and perhaps when he began writing, depending on when you date that. And I just think that gives a context that's really helpful. I do too. And you know, it's just not Papias. It, it's the unanimous testimony of the early church. People like Justin, Tertullian, you know, Irenaeus and Clement of Alexandria and others, they all, it's unanimous. It was Matthew, Mark, Luke, and it's virtually unanimous with John. So 
you know, we've got, I think we have some, and that's just the external evidence. There's internal evidence that also suggests, you know, these type of authors or that it's rooted in eyewitness testimony. What we have for the authorship of the Gospels is is actually better than what we have for Plutarch and for some of the other ancient authors. And yet classicists do not at all um, question, let's say, whether Plutarch wrote the 48 lives that have survived that have been attributed to him. They're anonymous, and our best source for that is called the Lamprius Catalog that's written at least 100 years after Plutarch's death and could be as long, as much as 200 or more years after Plutarch's death, and it's falsely attributed to Plutarch's son. And that is the main and first source that attributes the authorship to Plutarch's lives. And again, no classes of which I'm aware have questioned Plutarch's lives, that it, they were written by Plutarch. All right, so anything else to add on this, or should we move on? I mean, yeah, I mean, there's plenty we could talk about. I mean, <laughs> right. got internal evidence, external evidence, the, um, the, there are no good arguments to the contrary. Now, it, is the evidence for the traditional authorship of the Gospels, is it unimpeachable? No. Um, there are different ways of interpreting it, um, but the same could be said about virtually all other ancient literature, or at least a lot of it, even by our best authors such as uh, Livy and uh, Sallust and Plutarch and, and others. Um, you know, the, the evidence we have for the traditional authorship of the Gospels is better than we have for some of those. Again, it's not unimpeachable. And probably the most problems are with Matthean authorship, and we could go into that more. I'd be happy to do that, but we probably want to move on. I, I think it's just safe to conclude, you know, without getting into a whole lot of nitty-gritty here. I think we're safe in concluding, at least, to say that all four Gospels are rooted in eyewitness testimony.